so my nights were horrible. I stopped exercising, of course. I, I, I became, a, you know, my life became very small. I was really feeling like a victim. So I showed up on the 23rd to see a, a specific doctor and they told me you're going to see a different doctor. I was furious. Well, first of all, I am a mom of two adults, <laughs> Gabriel and Ingrid. I, um, on my free time, I'm an artist. So I paint, I've been uh, painting since I was in high school. So um, oils, watercolors, uh, acrylics. I am also an executive. I work for an aviation company. I'm the head of um, administrative operations there. So um, it's, a, it's a big job, so the, the painting kind of releases the stress. <laughs> Aside from that, um, I love, you know, getting together with my family because I love to cook. So I, at the end of 2021, um, say in the fall, I, my mother had passed away in August and I was going through a divorce. So, um, you know, I started feeling like um, shortness of breath, but I always, I, I always thought, you know, maybe I'm just really stressed out. And, um, but at, at one point it got so bad that I couldn't sleep lying down. I would have to sleep sitting up. And I knew it wasn't an asthma attack because it was different. It was, um, you know, the pressure was different in my lungs. And so that's when I decided to call my cardiologist. Um, she did some tests and then she told me that I was, um, she diagnosed me with something called pericarditis, pericarditis, which is like an inflammation of the walls or, you know, the outside of the heart. So that was the first, um, I, I, was, I would say, indication that there was something wrong. She gave me um, a treatment plan, two weeks. I was supposed to take um, like 25,000, I don't know, 100 milligrams of aspirin, some crazy stuff like that. But before I left her office, I looked at her and I said, what could cause this? You know, because you don't just randomly have something like that. And that question basically, you know, um, saved me. <laughs> I'm still here because she immediately looked at me and said, well, you know, it could be an immune, an, um, autoimmune disease. So I said, so who, who would I go for that? And she said, well, you could try a rheumatologist. And that's exactly what I did. So it was just like that one, if I had just walked away and said, okay, so I have this and now I have to treat it. But um, I think you need to go further and say always, what could cause that? You know, How, you know, it's just very random. I mean, if they tell you it's something genetic or, or caused by um, a medicine you're taking or something like that. But for her, there was no really other indication of, you know, that happening to me. So that kind of saved me. And then with she said like you could go but I I immediately in my mind was like I am gonna go I made the appointment and I saw the rheumatologist and she ran about um seven different blood tests on me so I had a very funny day because I had to go in to get my results from the rheumatologist and I was living in my in my daughter's apartment at the time she was the third floor walk up and I walked out and I got very dizzy and I fell downstairs and I had to call her to like help me untangle <laughs> myself because I had my laptop, everything. And I ran to the doctor's office. And the first question was, have you fallen? Have you been falling? Have you fainted recently? And I was like, oh, I just fell off <laughs> down the stairs. And she was like, maybe we should take you, you know, to the ER. And I was like, no, I have to go to work and I have meetings. 
Um, and it's that mentality um, of, of giving our job more importance than anything that's going on. And then she, she, I saw she was looking at me weird. And then she told me, well, your um, you're, um, hematocrit was something like 59 and your, your hemoglobin is 17. So you have to be not feeling well, right? And she said, I'm not a hematologist, so I can't give you any more details or tell you anything, but you need to see a hematologist immediately. I think the, her words didn't really make any sense to me because I've never had to deal with hemoglobin or anything like that. But the way her and her assistant were looking at me, they were looking at me like if I was a ghost, like I wasn't supposed to be standing. <laughs> so just their expression, um, you know, I immediately felt like a cold, um, you know, sensation, like from my heart to my stomach. And I said, okay, you know, I, I'll, I'll make an appointment immediately. Um, I called my, um, the same hospital where my cardiologist is. And I, um, I first went and like researched a doctor that had something to do with hematology that would be able to, you know, I read all of his credentials and made an appointment with, with him. So I get, this is like November 11th. And then I get the appointment for December 23rd, because that's, you know, how, how it works for specialists. Um, in the meantime, I went to a wedding in um, Colombia where I was born. I was with my, my, both of my kids. It was like a really hectic schedule and I started feeling like I couldn't breathe I couldn't go up the stairs but I was thinking this is probably the altitude and you know I'm in the mountains etc um, came back um, started getting very very ill very tired just extremely tired and um, and then I finally would go on the 23rd I had my appointment so I showed up on the 23rd to see a, a specific doctor and they told me you're going to see a different doctor and I said, well, that was not what I wanted. And they said, well, that's what we have available. And, you know, you're here and you feel very, um, you know, you, you just feel very trapped in the sense that I had already waited for a whole month to see the specific doctor. And then you have a situation where they told you it's urgent. And what are you going to walk away? No, you're, you're just going to go in and, and see whoever so you can get some answers. But I knew I was not with the person that I, I felt, you know, had the knowledge, basically. So I go in um, on the 23rd, I go in for my appointment. They draw blood and then I am immediately, um, you know, told that, you know, I need to kind of like wait around to see her. Um, she comes and she says, well, we'll have the results by tomorrow, but I believe what I'm looking at right now is a mistake, you know, from the lab. Like she was looking at the labs from the uh, rheumatologist and she said, I think they made a mistake. By tomorrow, we'll have our own lab results and, and it's probably going to be very different. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Um, you, once you go in there, I mean, I wasn't worried because she said, you know, there, it, it's probably a mistake. I completely trusted her, her views and went home. And then the next day, which was December, you know, on December 24th, I, I did get a call from her and said, you need to come in and you need to see me, um, next week. And I, I said, well, <laughs> I was like, well, I have a trip on Monday, so I have my ticket. And she's like, I don't think, you know, you're not, you, you can't travel. You can't get on a plane. And then that's when she explained to me, um, you know, your hemoglobin is so high that if you get on a plane right now, um, you could have a stroke. So I immediately had to cancel all of my plans. Um, my kids were devastated. <laughs> my family had a Airbnb, <laughs> you know, everything just um, abandoned. And then I went in to see her December 28th and, um, that was like her first available appointment and I arrived and at the minute that I got to the floor like before I, I left the elevator I was actually escorted out by the management because she had um, done a COVID test on me the week prior and it had come back positive so I was literally my daughter and I were like kicked out of the premises <laughs> and I'm like I had no idea it was probably that that was the worst Christmas of my life and I was sitting there just not knowing what it was. And uh, I had to wait until January 12th to see her again.
so she tells me um, she believes, um, she's very convinced that I have a polycythemia vera. And um, the way that we can immediately attack it is by doing phlebotomies. Um, and she wanted to start doing phlebotomies every two weeks. And um, I believe that was the first day that I, I ran from there, from her office to the infusion center and had attempted to have my first phlebotomy. That didn't work out very well I had to leave and come back the next day. Um, but yeah, that was like the, the it day because then you go home and you start looking this up and, you know, um, going into a bit of a panic. Uh, but in, when I realized what was happening to me emotionally, I called my, my one of my best friends, um, Bernice, and I, and her mom is a pediatrician. And I spoke to her and I said, hey, I just heard this. I'm, I'm very scared. She called her friend who's a hematologist in Venezuela and called me back and, and gave me like, the lifeline of words like she, she told me you're gonna be fine um it, it's controllable i have a friend that has this you know and i stopped searching and i just said okay i'm going with what she's saying you have to look for the most positive energy source and that was mine um from there on i start you know having phlebotomies um i, I think I, we started with every week because it was there was so much you know going on um i started getting really weak um very dehydrated i then i'm scheduled for a biopsy on february 7th um so she starts also checking we're, we're doing scans of the brain looking for you know um any sign of um you know strokes etc um where we're, she checked my entire body like we did you know scans of everything mris etc just to make sure i wasn't um you know having any blood clots because that's what the condition causes so on uh, february 7th i go in i do my biopsy um biopsy results usually take two to three weeks to come back um and then when you know the results come in by that time and during that time um, January 31st, actually, I had already called in because I was so weak from the phlebotomies that my, my doctor gave me a letter so I could get some uh, short term leave. So from the beginning of I mean, from the end of January to to the end of February, I'm already on medical leave, um, you know, trying to control this. Um, I um, at one point I started telling her, look, I, I don't think I can do these uh, things because I go home for two, three days. I'm like useless. So could you give me some fluids? Because I started figuring out that the pain I was feeling was probably from being dehydrated. So she changed kind of like the, the way we were doing it. And she would um, ask them to give me, you know, do the phlebotomy and then give me like two hours of, of fluids afterwards. And then the results come in. And then of course, you know, we have a, a very different conversation, her and I, um, you know, and she tells me, um, you know, this is gonna be a lifelong situation where you're gonna be taking blood out. I need you, you know, to be at a certain level where, yeah, you know, you're, you're kind of anemic. We need to lower your, you know, your um, hemoglobin to at least 11 or 12, you know? And I was like, okay, you know, let's do it. Because to me, it was just like, I was already there. She, um, you know, I wasn't going to go and look for anything else because I felt overwhelmed, you know, and that's why you should do the research before, because once you're in there and you get that diagnosis, your mindset is very different. You know, you, you just like, you, you know, you're like uh, in um, a crisis and shock um, mode. It was tough because I, you know, with it came the knowledge that, you know, because you're making so many red blood cells in your bone marrow is like overactive, you start, you know, your bone marrow starts kind of getting tired and it starts getting um, um, fibrosis, which is like a scar tissue that starts creating. And so she tells me, you know, on point, we're going to we might get to a level where you know the opposite happens and you you know you stop making the red blood cells and we go into something like leukemia so this is like terrifying news um at the same time she said something which was kind of weird <laughs> she said well of all the cancers you could get this is the best one um i don't i don't 
I, don't, I didn't agree with that <laughs> because I don't think there's anything that you could say to someone um, that would sound good <laughs> in that moment. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a knowledge that it was progressive that there was absolutely no cure for this. Um, I Googled, has anyone ever gone into remission? And I, had, I found one person in 1984. So I kept it in my, like in one of my phones, um, you know, URLs. I kept it there since, until like this year. And I would look at it like if one person could, could get out of this, then so can I. <laughs> so you go home uh, from the phlebotomies. Um, I think it's 500 cc's that they take out every time you go. Um, and you feel, but I had to drive myself because my, you know, my, my, my entire family is working at this time. Um, by the time I was getting home, you know, your eyelids start getting heavy. I had to go up to three floors <laughs> and then you start feeling, um, you know, all your joints just, it's like a toothache, you know, in your bones. Um, and then progressively, um, I started having pain, uh, in my hip. Um, and then I couldn't sleep at night because you start sweating, you have night sweats. So I would, I had to purchase this little machine um, that is like a little air conditioner. And like four times uh, during the night, I would have to put that on. And I had the air conditioner going at home <laughs> and just had to put that on so I could, you know, come back to like normal. Um, then I start chewing ice. Um, it, there's a condition called pica that um, is caused by severe anemia, and then you get addicted to ice. So you so I'll be chewing ice all day, and then at night I would have to pee like seven times a night. So my, my nights were horrible. I stopped exercising, of course. I I I became, a, you know, my life became very small. Um, and then I had a conversation with, you know, with my dad, and I told him, I, I feel like I can't do anything, you know, I, I don't have the strength to, to move around to do the things that I normally do. And he said, you have to move. And that voice stayed with me. And then he said, even if it is where I live, there was like nowhere to walk around. And he said, even if you go to the parking lot, and you go two, three times around the parking lot, you have to move. And it's true, because, you know, it's all about your circulation and the blood clot situation. So you need to move and that. She had told me that, but as I heard it from my, from my dad, you know, I wasn't really, I was really feeling like a victim. Like I'm just taking in, you know, hits and I wasn't coming out and doing anything about it. And that gave me like my first fighting punch. You know, I was like, okay, let me move. And I started moving and I would wake up every morning and I would do yoga like I would, in my room um, because I didn't want to like move around too much. Like I would get and I would do meditation. I would do yoga. So I started feeling that, um, you know, she, you know, we were just taking blood out and taking blood out. And I, I thought at one point I was going to feel better um, and, and kept asking her, well, I, I have to go back to work. Am I going to feel better? And she kept saying, you need to adjust your your lifestyle to to the condition. And I said, but there has to be something. So at one point she uh, suggested hydrea, and she said that my insurance had approved it if I wanted to go on it. And I said, no, I don't. I don't want to take that. I don't feel that you know that's that's going to add to anything. I I've studied it. I've seen the the you know the side effects, and I don't. I mean. I don't think that I'm at the level where, you know, I, I would be able to handle that. I want to feel better before I, I go to a next step like that, you know? And she was really struggling with me. And so I could tell that, that she kept looking at my results and kind of, you know, scratching her head, like what's going on? Because one day was the platelets and then it was the white blood cells. And then, you know, she was really like getting a handle on it. By May, um, I went to, to do my phlebotomy May 10th, and they, the nurse told me, you are a hemoglobin level of eight. And basically, at that point, anyone who is a nurse or a doctor knows you can't take more blood from that person. I know that now. I didn't know that then. And she asked me, is it okay? Do you think we should take the blood out? And I look at her and I said, I'm not a doctor. 
you need to talk to my doctor. I, I'm not, you know, you guys know, because I don't know what she's at that point. I didn't know if she was dealing with platelets or, you know, or him, you know, or, or red blood cells. Well, why, why am I, you know, still here? And, um, you know, she said, okay, we'll talk to your doctor. I came back uh, May 19th for another phlebotomy. So they took blood out that day and then they took out blood again on June 7th. So that's two times after I'm at hemoglobin A because the gentleman that was doing my, my phlebotomy that day refused to do the, the IV on me. He said, you know, I don't have the right package. I'm not going to do it. He took my blood out in 11 minutes. It would normally take 30 minutes. And he just, I mean, he destroyed me. After that, I was so sick. My daughter, um, you know, started calling the doctor at night. She started to call. She told me she was going to call 911. I'm like, no, because I was afraid of going to the hospital because no one, it is a very rare disease and I knew no one would know what to do with me. So on the night I came back, they gave me the fluids and by the, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to work. Okay. So I, I would get to the office, I would call, um, you know, my, my security guard. Um, so Jason would come down and I told him the first day I said, I said, I'm so sorry because I know this is not your job you know, scope or anything, but I need a, fa a human favor. I can't carry my laptop anymore. And so he would wait for me. Um, I would give him the, the laptop bag and all the stuff that we carry for work. And then I would, you know, have this huge thing of ice that I, I had to eat. The ice had some sort of chemical reaction in the brain that gives you like a little bit of oxygen. And so it would make me feel a little better. Lunch, I couldn't have a normal, like I couldn't have like rice and potato. No, I would have, I would have a carrot and a cucumber because if I ate like a normal lunch, I would fall asleep on my desk. And that's when I, you know, I realized like, you know, this is, this can't be it. You know what I mean? Like, how is this happening? I went to my sister's house that the weekend of Father's Day and uh, Saturday, I couldn't talk. Like I, you know, I, I sat there and I couldn't talk. I couldn't move around. And then the next morning, which is Father's Day, I drove myself to the ER and they told me your hemoglobin is at six. Um, we need to do a, a blood transfusion immediately. And I said, no, because my doctor had already told me like, you can't get a blood transfusion because then, you know, the uh, red blood cells are going to just explode, you know, and whatever. So I refused it. And then I waited, I think maybe two more days to see her because she was coming back from vacation. And when she finally saw my labs, she said to me, I am so sorry, I miscalculated your numbers and you will need a blood transfusion now. I was furious. I was furious because and then she said, and once you get the blood transfusion, you're going to start making blood like crazy. And we're going to be back to the level that you were in January. And I, I mean, imagine after going through this every two weeks, phlebotomies and all the pain and that, how am I going to go back to that? It, that didn't make sense to me. So I told her, look, and she said, we need to go right now. We need to put you in the ER. I said, no, I need some time. This is a serious, you know, situation of blood transfusion is something very serious I need to talk to my family um you know I, I need to go home and I need to think about this and she was not very happy with me saying no because I think she realized the responsibility of me just going home the way that I was you know and and so that's when I called her back like on a Thursday I spoke to her and I said yes okay I'm gonna go through with the blood transfusion Okay, she said, I'm going to have your, my, my office call you and schedule it immediately. And they never called me back ever to this day, not even to find out if I'm still alive. So then I started researching who had the best, you know, hematology group for my condition. So I found, you know, South Miami Hospital. I found Dr. Um, Kim, who was the, you know, in charge of blood uh, disorders. And so I went to her hospital but went through the, uh, you know, through the emergency and 
and um, and then I was assigned to her from there. I got my blood transfusion. I think it was June twenty fourth, um, and yeah, my my hemoglobin went from eight from six to eight within you know a few days, and then I was um, you know with uh, with a new hospital, a new doctor, and uh, went from there. She came and she told she told me. Natalia, I'm going to have to do another biopsy, which I was terrified. <laughs> and I said, but no, she goes, it just doesn't make sense to me. I've been giving you iron for months and nothing changes. And now I see your platelets are up. I, this doesn't make sense. And so February 7th, I go through another biopsy and she calls me two weeks later and says, um, you know, you, you actually have primary myelofibrosis, not post-athemia therapy. And so it makes sense because smile fibrosis, sometimes you're making a lot of red blood cells, sometimes you're making zero, and sometimes the problem is the platelets or the white blood cells. So whatever she was reading, because she had the other doctor's, you know, uh, diagnosis and notes was not what, what is actually happening.